He Krishna, Karuna Sindhu, Dinabandhu Jagatpate, Gopesha Gopika Kanta, Radha Kanta Namostate, Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi, Radhe Vrindavane Swari, Vrishabhanu Suti Devi, Pranamami Hari Priye, Vancha Kalpa, Tarubhishcha, Kripa Sindhu Peevacha, Patitanam Pavane Bhyo, Vaishnave Bhyo, Namaho Namaha, Nama Om Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Pristaya Bhutale, Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamane Namaste Saraswati Devi Gaudavani Pacharine Nirvishesha Sunyavari Pastyatya De Satarine Jaya Sri Krishna Chaitana Prabhunatananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasudhi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai <laughs> and so <clears throat> he uh, there was a one Britisher who was staying in India around the 1700s <clears throat> and he was wanted to find out a little bit more about the Indian educational system of course the British wanted to understand the Indian educational system so they could you know, supplant their own educational system in. So they did some little surveys and they found, they took, they found from the year 1750 to the year 1800 that there was approximately 700,000 villages in India at the time. <clears throat> and out of the 700,000 villages, more than 500,000 had schools educational uh, places, places of education, gurukuls, and other types of educational, mostly for young kids. Uh, a lot of those schools were also participated in by the ladies. The girls were also going to school. And further research found that in those schools, three, the three books were studied as the main three books. And that was Mahabharat, Ramayan, and... Um, uh, Srimad Bhagavatam. And so um, we understand that these actually are three of the main scriptures that we, we take what we say information from, we study, we learn from, we practice, we get inspiration from. Um, each of them deals with a particular aspect of, we say, spirituality, although all three deal with spirituality. Mahabharat uh, it's, it's more like hardcore reality. It takes you right into the lives of the different saints, kings, a lot of kings, wars, romances, intrigues, you know, various types of situations where you find there's a lot of conflict, there's a lot of interactive uh, problems between uh, various persons. Uh, it talks about the problems, it talks about what causes the problems, but one thing Mahabharata doesn't, it doesn't really give you answers. It lets you figure it out for yourself. A lot of the time, just like we were reading yesterday, how one king, Astaka, uh, he was asking about, well, what is, the de what is the highest destination one can attain after death? And then uh, King Yayati was the person he had asked. King Yayati quoted a series of verses from the Mahabharata, which described those qualities that lead to higher realms of existence, to success in life. But he then he went on to explain that the thing that destroys it is pride. Now, although he gave the what you focus on in order to attain those higher realms and he also showed what characteristic or what an artha destroys it there's not much given about how to overcome this pride <laughs> therefore we go to other scriptures and we find that a lot of the answers that are posed in the Mahabharata are answered in scriptures such as the Ramayan and in the Srimad Bhagavatam so Ramayan deals a lot with character, 
good character. You'll find practically everyone in the Mahabharata, I mean, I'm sorry, Ramayan has great character. Except for Mantara, that uh, hunchback who influenced Kaikei, practically everyone's character is exemplary in the way they dealt with each other. Even on the battlefield, we found, you know, how, you know, how Vibhishan, although he was the brother of, of uh, Ram, he loved his brother, respected his brother, in many cases even obeyed his brother Ravana, who was a powerful king and also quite demoniac. But he was loyal to his own feelings of what is worthy in life, and that was devotion to the Supreme Lord. So he, he always respected his brother. At the same time, he followed his own, what we say, understanding of what is the truth. And therefore, of course, he took shelter of Lord Ramachandra. So we find in the, the Ramayana, as you go through it, there's a lot of good character. And then uh, you come to Srimad Bhagavatam, and what does Bhagavatam deal with bhakti or devotion? So we don't need to make much explanations on that. It's about, you know, the devotees, how they execute devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the different trials and tribulations they face, how they overcome them, and how they actually become successful and reach the stage of devotional service or pure devotional service. That's Srimad Bhagavatam. So you find that these three scriptures were always the main three scriptures in the teachings throughout the Indian continent, subcontinent. And people learned these three, studied these three. Now, we, we know also in the Mahabharata, uh, because there is a lot of intrigue, there is also a lot of war, there's a lot of uh, what we say, lying, cheating, other things, killing. Uh, and, uh, and people have a tendency, especially in this age of Kali Yuga, to like that kind of stories, activities. So Vyasadeva was very, very expert in trying to help people understand higher principles. So he very carefully put the Bhagavad Gita inside the Mahabharata, which gave people a little bit of the understanding of the absolute truth in the scripture of uh, Mahabharata. And Mahabharata is huge. It has 200,000 verses. It's practically the great, greatest epic it is, not, not practically, in the world. So there's great, many great incidents which is teaching so many different characteristics. And one of them is that <clears throat> Of course, we know about the intrigue between the Pandavas and the Kurus, and how ultimately uh, uh, Dhritarashtra was meant to inherit the throne, but because he was not, because he was blind, we couldn't have a blind king on the throne. So Pandu was actually the person to to get the throne, but Pandu had somehow died, and therefore. His sons, the Yud headed by King Yudas there, were the rightful heirs to the throne. But we have the problem that uh, because of nepotism and because of family affection, uh, King uh, Dhritarashtra did everything he could to make sure the Pandavas weren't on the throne and his sons headed by Duryodhana. Now Duryodhana, you know, what was his characteristic? He was always harsh, cheating, critical, uh, doing various things to, uh, to somehow fix his position in a better, just like he got Bhishma and he also got Karna to somehow join his sign, side because he was expert at giving praise and money and various types of gifts in order to get their favor, to get their attention. And he did that with Bhishma, he did that with Karna. And of course, both of them joined his side. So Diodana felt himself invincible, and he felt that now I want to rule the world. And of course, he was supported by his blind father, who was the 
who was the king, King uh, Dhritarashtra. So Krishna did everything he could to somehow or other convince Dhritarashtra and Duryodhana that the Pandavas were Kshatriyas, they have a right to rule, they're actually heirs to the throne. Therefore, please give them something to rule. So there was a big discussion between the Pandavas and Krishna, and they decided that, okay, we will give them, we will ask for just five villages, that's all. And that's all they would, they would be satisfied with five villages. But because Duryodhana was so avaricious that when Krishna made that proposal to Duryodhana, when he came there, he came as a friend. There's a nice story called Krishna Duke. Krishna was the messenger. And he came on behalf of the Pandavas, but he came as a peace messenger. He wanted to bring peace. He knew there was a war about to begin. And he simply wanted to avert the war, but give the posi some position to the Pandavas to rule. Now, Diodano listened to Krishna's proposal and practically insulted Krishna after he was done and said, I will not give any such land even to put enough land on the head of a pin. And at that point, it was obvious that there was going to be conflict. <laughs> and so, now, Krishna didn't give up. Later on, he went again, this time to Dhritarashtra. And there was a great assembly of sages and saints who had come to gather for this meeting. Krishna came. He offered his respects to Dhritarashtra. And he explained the situation. That because your son, Diodhana, he's so greedy, he's so avaricious, He's so hostile to the Pandavas, which are, they're all related, actually. The Dikoros and the Pandavas were just like cousin brothers. They practically have the same fathers and uncles. The uncles and fathers were all related to each other. And uh, so Krishna made the proposal that, and Dhritarashtra again rejected it. And this time, Diodhana, first Diodhana rejected, then Dhritarashtra rejected. And this time, Krishna said, well, in that case, you should give up your, what we say, your son. You should abandon him. When Krishna said that, the entire assembly became silent and shocked. Krishna spoke so strongly at that time that everyone became really overwhelmed. What is Krishna saying Dhritarashtra should give up his own son and all his other sons. And Dhritarashtra remained silent and refused to respond. At that point, a great personality was in the audience, and that great personality was Parasaram. Parasaram happened to be there, and he came forward, and he said, My dear king, I would like to speak to you. I have something to say, which will be for your ultimate benefit. And if you understand what I'm trying to say, you will understand that it is for your good and for the good of the entire kingdom, which will bring peace and glory to the entire dynasty. And he said, now I will not only speak, but I will narrate a story by which you can understand what I'm trying to say. And he went back and talked, and he narrated one particular story. And he said, listen to these statements. And he said, many, 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 uh, millennia, many, many, many years ago, there was one mighty ruler called Dumbo Bhava, who unrestrictedly enjoyed his property. Each night, early morning, he would question his Brahmins and Kshatriyas, asking them, is there anyone who walks the surface of the earth that is more powerful than I am? Is there anybody out there that is any better than me? And he, he would also answer the question, I know that there is no one greater than me, no one is more powerful me, than me, I am indefeatable. 
He had such a narcissist complex. He was so proud. He had behaved in this haughty behavior, in this haughty way. He would ask the Brahmins again and again in order to get some glorification. One time, when his pride became so strong, the Brahmins became somewhat fed up with seeing this. And then they said to him, they spoke to the king as follows. There are two men on this planet who have won over many warriors. They are the best among men, and you are no match for these two, O king. When the Brahmin said this, the king asked who they, who they were, where they had taken birth, what were, their, what were their victories, what were their names. The Brahmins replied, we have heard that these two great sages are named Nara and Narayan, and they are performing such intense austerities on the Gadamadavam hill that it can't be described in words. The, the king, he could not tolerate what he had heard, and so he took all his armies in six divisions with warriors, elephants, chariots, horses, camels, and various kinds of weapons, and he went searching through the forest in Gandamadad Hill. He found the secluded place. Both of them, he, he, he saw these two sages. He said both of them appeared very weak, and they were hungry, and they, do, they looked weak due to hunger and thirst. Their bodies were emaciated. Their veins were showing. They had intolerated so great austerities. The king approached them. Nara Narayan welcomed them, seated the king down, gave him fruits, water, roots, made him feel very welcome. And they asked him, my dear king, I know you have come for some reason. How can we serve you? The king said to them, through my strong arms, I have, in, I have won over the entire wor world and killed over my, all my enemies. I have come to fight with you too. This has been my desire. Kindly offer this request as a way of your hospitality. Nara Narayan replied, this ashram is a place where anger and greed cannot stay. There can be no fighting in this ashram. What to speak of weapons and the deceitful mindset of war. There are many kshatriyas on this planet. Kindly fulfill your desire for warfare somewhere else. <laughs> Parasaram continues his narration to King Dhritarashtra. Both of them repeatedly said the same thing and expressed their regret and tried to convince the king in different ways. Still, King Dambo Bhava desired, desired war and continued to challenge both. At that time, Nara took up some grass in his hand and said, O oh, Kshatriya, lust for full battle, come in hand and fight. Take all your weapons and bring your entire army. Today I shall relieve you of your desire for combat. Dambobara Baba said, O oh, austere sage, if you consider this insignificant grass weapon to be suitable to fight with me, I will engage in battle with you, for I have come here solely for that purpose. Parasaram continues his narration. The assembly is completely absorbed, quiet. Having said this, Dumbo Baba showered arrows from all directions on Nara, along with his army, in order to kill him. His tremendous arrows were sufficient to rip apart any, any enemy, but the sage without hesitation destroyed all those arrows using blades of grass. Thereafter, the undefeatable Nara employed the ferocious Isaka weapon, which could not be destroyed. It dealt heavy damages to the king's armies. The sage Nara, who was expert at hitting target, cut off the ears, eyes, noses of the soldiers by merely using a piece of, piece of grass. Seeing the entire sky filled with deadly blades of grass, King Dabobara fell at Nara's feet and begged forgiveness, saying, O oh Lord, there must be auspiciousness for me. Let there be auspiciousness for me. 
Nar, the great shelter of those who desire it, said, O king, from now on be saintly, favorable to the Brahmins. Never do this again. Serve others. Become a proper kshatriya. Behave, mm -hmm. behave properly. Give up your abominable activities. Mm -hmm. Don't re ridicule any other kings, either weaker or stronger than you. Rule the earth, become free from greed, be prideless, inquisitive, control your senses, become forgiving, be mild and gentle-hearted, and thus you will be able to rule your king and kingdom happily. Do not real ridicule anyone. Thereafter, King Dumbo Bhava offered his obeisance to the sages and returned to his kingdom. Now we go back to the assemble, assembly. Parasaram said, that great sage Nara performing this amazing feat in the past, even greater than him is, in various qualities, is Lord Narayan. O Dhritarashtra, as long as Arjuna has not employed divine weapons on his Gandiva bow, it is better to you to go meet him and arrange for a compromise. And then... Uh, it's interesting, then there is a listing of some of the deadly weapons that uh, Nar Narayan has in his, we say, hands to use. And now, Dhritarashtra, the controller, oh Dhritarashtra, the controller of all worlds and knower of all karma, Narayan is the friend of Arjuna, Nara. That Arjuna is unconquerable in war, O king. Who in the three worlds can think of conquering Arjuna, who carries the great monkey emblem on his flag? Arjuna has unlimited good qualities, and Lord Janardana is even greater than him. You know both these things very well. So now he's entreating him. You know that these two personalities cannot be defeated. Still, you don't want to give up your envy for the Pandavas. Those who are renowned as Nar and Narayan are now Arjuna and Krishna respectively. So now he reveals who these two persons are. They are the greatest warriors. And if you do not doubt my words, then listen to me and accept, my, and accept a compromise with the Pandavas. O oh, best of the Bharta, if you desire that your family be not divided and ruined, then accept compromise and do not think of war. O oh, great, oh, greatest among the Kurus, to ensure that your now family stays on this planet and to ensure that you attain auspiciousness, think about what I said and how it will benefit you. Now this is interesting. Dhritarashtra is hearing from Krishna. He's hearing from uh, of course, is also his brother, uh, Vidura, who was always his well-wisher. And now he's hearing from the great incarnation of the Lord Parasaram directly, who this Krishna and Arjuna actually is and how they are undefeatable in battle. Therefore, make a compromise with them. It says that Dhritarashtra was blind, but he was blind in two ways. Physically, his eyes were now able to perceive the external environment. He was born like that. He never saw the light of day. But he had a greater blindness. He was blind to the truth. So many well-wishers, so many persons who desired his, what we say, best interest and the interests of his family, were giving him advice. He couldn't accept it attachment to his family members were so strong that even in the face of so much obvious evidence that what he was about to, what we say, authorize or sanction, he wanted his sons to rule the throne. This was against the will of Krishna and this was against the rule of actually proper inheritance. Still, he could not hear. Sometimes we must also see how attachment sometimes becomes so deep that even though something is right, one cannot fulfill it. 
In the Shastras, this is called weakness of heart. Weakness of heart means I know what's right, yet I can't do it. We might say, or we, or I, I don't want to do it. Sometimes we see, and even in devotional service, devotee is making progress. He comes to a certain stage of his development, but what happens? He faces one attachment. He can't, he thinks, oh, I have to give up this attachment, otherwise how will I continue my devotional service? But the attachment is so strong, or appears to be so strong, he fails to take shelter of those who can help him in this situation. He relies on his own mind and senses to determine the situation. And this is called weakness of heart. He remains attached to this whatever it is. It's like sometimes with some, some a little thing, just like when Prabhupada was in the when Prabhupada was in the Twenty uh, Sixth Second Avenue when he was first beginning his beginning his movement with the young devotees there. Prabhupada was giving classes regularly, every three nights a week, uh, for about an hour, and there would be a break at one point in the evening activities, and the devotees would go outside and take a cigarette break and come back in. Uh, Prabhupada tried different ways to encourage people to give up, but finally at one point he said, don't let such a little thing like that stand between you and Krishna. <laughs> So sometimes we find that in our devotional service, some attachment is still there for whatever it may be. It could be to a, an individual. It could be a, to a type of sense gratification. It could be to a, a particular way of thinking that we cannot change or don't want to change. And so that is called weakness of heart. And so we see this great king, Dhritarashtra, uh, he had so many well-wishers. I mean, Vidura was his younger brother. And he was always trying to help his brother, other brother with giving good advice. And saying that, you know, you can live happily. Just divide the kingdom. Your sons can rule one part and let them. But he was so attached to whatever his, that his uh, son Diodana wanted, that whatever Diodana wanted, he supported. Because you could call it love, but it's more like what we call a false sense of sentiment. Here we have Parasaram giving him a clear understanding that who is he fighting against if he begins a war? He's fighting against the Supreme Personality of Godhead and his eternal associate who are invincible in battle. And so still, at one point, there is a discussion where Dita Roster actually admits, I can hear what you're saying. When he was talking to Vidura one time, Vidura was telling him similar things. I can hear what you're saying, but I can't do it. <laughs> I can't do it. I'm st he was still so attached to this family affection that it brought such... Uh, what we say, ignorance to his mind, that he ultimately, it cost him everything. And all his sons were eventually killed, and the kingdom was eventually given to the Pandavas, which were the right, rightful heir to the throne. And uh, so many, 640 million soldiers were killed in that battle. They call it the greatest war in the history of wars. And so just because of some arrogance, pride due to leadership. And we see that even, even in today's world where leaders who are somehow or other in the position to lead others, they don't know how to lead. And they have their own selfish interests and they sacrifice the interests of the population for the interests of a few people or for some monetary or for some some gain for some power or some rule. So uh, this is a, a feature. Therefore, until one understands higher principles that 
one who worships the Supreme Personality of Godhead in devotion by following the instructions of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in order to please the Supreme Personality of Godhead, then whatever activities they perform always fall short of success. Okay, and that's where Srimad Bhagavatam comes in. So uh, Mahabharata is interesting. You'll find so many interesting stories, personalities, intrigues, great heroes such as Bhishma Dev. Bhishma Dev, although he was a, uh, a sympathetic, very sympathetic to the Pandavas, he fought on the side of the Kurus against the Pandavas. Why did he do that? Sometimes qu people question, why did Bhishma Dev, who was actually inclined to the Pandavas, take the side against the Pandavas? There is actually a reason that has been given, and this also is mentioned, I think in one purport in the Srimad Bhagavatam, where Prabhupada reveals this, in the passing away of Bhishma Dev within that ninth chapter of the first canto, wherein he says that, Ultimately, Bhishma Dev wanted to prove that anyone who is against Krishna will lose. <laughs> and anyone who is against Krishna will lose. Even him, he was so powerful, Bhishma Dev, that he could not die unless he decided to. He could die of his own will. He was given that benediction and blessing by his powerful father, Shantanu who in his previous life was a great king called Mahabisha, who also ruled the world in a very righteous way. And Shantanu and Bisha, Mahabisha, were related together in the previous life, and now they had come again as father and son in this particular Leela, in uh, the story with uh, the, the bringing of the, the three brothers into the world, Pandu, uh, Vichitavarya and Chitra, was it Chitranga? Chitranga, Chitranga, Vichitavarya, Pandu, of course, the Vidura, the three brothers that were born from Parasuram. Okay, so these are some of the uh, things we can consider in terms of uh, taking good advice from superiors. We find nowadays a lot of times, um, maybe because it's somehow somewhat of the Western tendency, that even though one accepts superiors as their, what we say, guides and teachers, they still question the instructions and guidance given to them by their superiors and sometimes go against those instructions. Um, and obviously this is what what, ha what happened to Dhritarashtra, because the, but that was more full-blown in the sense that it cost him everything. His life, ultimately he had to give up his life. He went to the forest and of course, by the mercy of Vidura, he attained a, a high destination. But he lost everything before then. Okay, so I'm sure there's a, maybe a few questions out there. Do we have any comments or questions at this point? Well, one of the weaknesses of Bhishma Dev, if you look at it from the material perspective, is that he was meant to be the next king, but because he favored his father's wedding with Satyavati, he promised that fisherman, Dasaraja, that he would not take the throne and not only not him, he would not marry. He was a Kshatriya that was meant to rule without a kingdom. 
And so he really, he had no support in life. And so when Duryodhana saw the situation with Bhishmadev, and he, he realized who he was, he used whatever charm he could in order to entice Bhishmadev to come to his side and give him all support, give him power, give him position, give him command over the armies. So in that point, at that point, Bhishmadev felt not only obliged, but here's an opportunity uh, to engage in Kshatriya activities. He was a Kshatriya without activities. He couldn't rule, and there was no fighting going on. He was ba basically, you might say, he was unemployed. <laughs> so, and your, your question is, you ended it with a question on a personal level? What was that? Well, if you feel yourself being manipulated, then you should know this is something that you should be careful of and avoid, or try to avoid. Um, we can you take a hypothetical situation where someone wants something from someone, and therefore they use all kinds of praise and gifts to somehow get that person's favor, and when they get that person's favor, they ask for something for themselves. Um, that we find that a lot of times in Mahabharata, that's what happened. So, um, and therefore, a devotee is not obliged to anyone. He's obliged only to follow the instructions of his spiritual master and engage in devotional service. So when someone, even if you do, someone does something for you, and then they expect something in return. You would say, well, whatever you did for me, I just offered it to my spiritual master, and therefore I, I just engaged your activities in, in devotional service. So if you're asking something for me that I can do and I feel comfortable with, that's fine. But if it's against my nature, uh, we have to say we just can't do that. But if you feel yourself being tricked into it, and then you have to be well, we are cautious not to allow that to happen. But I don't think that happens so often that someone will try to use us in order to get something done. And sometimes people who like devotees, who sometimes gravitate towards our movement, make friends with certain devotees, and then want to ask the devotees to help them in their material life. And so that happened to me. And uh, of course, I just very politely refused to be part of that. So yeah, you just have to refuse when you realize it's against your, pr we have to live by principle. If we don't live by principle, what do we live by? A greedy person or a, a self-interested person lives by personal gain, whatever they can gain from every situation. Principles are adjustable according to the situation. But a devotee lives by principle. And therefore we follow the principles that, that, that make up devotional life. And that one of our main principle is that we have dedicated our life to the service of the Lord, and anything that's contrary to that is to be rejected. Sanatana Goswami writes that in Brihat, no, I'm sorry, in Hari Bhakti Vilas, where he says that one should reject anything that's unfavorable for one's spiritual practice. So if that, if you're feeling manipulated in an unfavorable way, you can refuse based on that principle. Thank you. Thank you. I saw another name come up, Shamarani. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. No. 
Anyone else? Ariva Maharajali. Let's mention in the Srimad Bhagavatam is actually uh, there's a nice story behind it is that uh, Duryodhana said to uh, Bhishma Dev, you know, I can see your affection for the Pandavas and therefore you're not fighting to your capacity. Uh, Bhishma came and Bhishma Dev was a little bit insulted. And when you say a Kshatriya is not fighting to their capacity, it's kind of like an insult. And so he became a little upset. And then he said to Diodana, tomorrow I have five arrows and I will take these five arrows and I will kill the five Pandavas. <laughs> and so Diodana said, okay, but you know, something may happen to those arrows between now and then. <laughs> so leave the arrows with me and then tomorrow I will give you the arrows. So Bhishma placed those five arrows with Duryodhana. So Krishna, he knows everything. He has his, uh, you know, you know, he has his CIA working. <laughs> he knows everything that's going on. So um, he said to Arjun, Arjun, don't you remember that many years ago when we were in the forest, you know, the uh, Duryodhana also came and then he came to attack us but then the Gandharvas came, and the Gandharvas fought with Duryodhana and his armies and defeated them. And then just before the, uh, the defeat, um, Duryodhana was about to be killed, but we saved his life. And then he fell at the feet of Yudhisthira and thanked Yudhisthira for saving his life from being killed by the Gandharvas. So at that point, uh, Duryodhana said, because you have given me, say, given me shelter and saved my life, you know, I'm indebted to you. You can ask anything you want from me. Yudhisthira didn't say anything at the time, and Duryodhana left. So now Krishna remembered that whole situation. He said, now Duryodhana owes a favor to us, so now you go ask for that favor. And what you ask for is for those five arrows that Duryodhana is holding for Bhishma Dev. So Arjun comes, he comes to Duryodhana. Now the interesting how Kshatriya culture works, they fight during the day, but at night they meet together in the camps and they're talking like in friendly, friendly talks. And so that one evening Arjun came and uh, Duryodhana welcomed him. He said, oh, Arjun, you've come. Uh, you come for a certain reason? He said, yes, I've come to ask you something. Oh, what are you going to ask? If you want the kingdom, I'm willing to give it to you. And he said, no, we will not, we will not ask, come for the kingdom without due respects to the agreement of to, to fight. But I do have one request. What is that? I want those five arrows you're holding for Bhishma. And of course, Diyodhana, being true to his word, and Kshatriya, when a Kshatriya gives his word, he, he would rather give up his life than give up his word. And so immediately he handed over the five arrows to, uh, to Arjun. Now when Bhishma learned the next day what had happened, that Krishna had tricked uh, uh, Diyodhana to, to give in the, those arrows, Bhishma became even more enthusiastic to fight. And so now he was fighting really hard. And at one point he was, he was fighting with Arjuna and Arjuna's chariot was smashed and Arjuna fell off the chariot. Krishna fell off the chariot too. 
our Bhishma Dev was really fighting to his best capacity. Now, no one could stand against Bhishma Dev. So now, what had happened was Krishna decided to break his promise because Krishna said, I'm not going to fight. At the beginning of the, before the battle, he, he, he was with Ardurna and, and uh, Arjun. And when he, when Krishna came in, Krishna was there, Duryodhana and Arjun came to see Krishna. When Krishna, Krishna looked up, he saw Arjun at his feet and Duryodhana right by his head. So he saw Arjuna first. And so he said, why have you both come? Well, we have come to ask something. We're, we, uh, we would like you to fight. So Krishna said, all right, I can't fight, but my f armies can fight. Therefore, one of you can choose my armies and one of you can choose me, but whoever chooses me, I'm not fighting. The Odin had the first choice. He said, what's the use of you if you're not fighting? I'll take your armies. And Arjuna wound up with Krishna. So now Krishna is on the chariot and he promised never to fight. He was simply the chariot driver. But when he saw Arjuna was in danger and his chariot was smashed, he grabbed the broken chariot wheel and charged at Krishna and mentions that he was charging with great anger, so much so that his, his charter was flying in the wind and it flew off his body, but he kept running. When Bhishma Dev saw that, he started firing arrows at Krishna. Now Bhishma Dev was so happy because he actually wanted Krishna to fight with him because he has a chivalrous rasa with Krishna. So he was feeling, now I have actually reached perfection. And it says that the arrows were hitting Krishna just like when two lovers are together in a loving embrace, there's sometimes there's some biting. This is sp spoken by uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. He gives this commentary. Sometimes these are called love bites. And so Krishna was accepting the arrows coming from Bhishma Dev as a lover accepts the love bites from his beloved. And, Arj and Krishna was angry, charging, but Bhishma Dev was so happy. And then, of course, you know, then uh, 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 that, that, that continues and then describes how Krishna had broken his promise and then was fighting with Bhishma Dev, like that. But Bhishma Dev was so happy to get a chance to, to actually fight with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Later on, of course, in, in the fight with Arjun, uh, there's a whole other story of how ultimately Bhishma Dev was defeated by Arjun, but that's another part of the story. But I think that answers your question. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you. Yeah, you can read about it in the Srimad Bhagavatam, 1st Canto, ninth chapter. Thank you, Srimad. There's a beautiful picture of Krishna also that was painted by the devotees of Krishna running, carrying the chariot wheel, his eyes red, red hot with anger, and his, char and his charter flying in the wind. It's a beautiful picture. Yes, it is. It is. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Anything else? <laughs> Maharaj, there's a question on the chat. Um, it just said iPhone. Um, if you want, I could read the question for you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble blessings. Why Krishna didn't protect Dropti when she is insulted by Duryodhana? What Krishna wants to teach us through Krishna's whole life? Hmm. 
Yeah, Bhishma, Bhishma was criticized for that. He didn't say anything. And I think it was because of his loyalty to Duryodhana. But it says that that was one of the reasons why he actually was defeated at the end in the battlefield because he failed to give protection to a, a lady who was in need. But it was his attachment to Duryodhana. And he knew that if he did that, he, he would anger Duryodhana, so he didn't do that. There may be more reasons to that, but that was the obvious one because he had taken allegiance on the side of Diodana. Anything else? He was blind to, he was spiritually blind, physically blind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, spiritually blind, but more to blindness was because of his you know, love for his children. He couldn't see mm -hmm. beyond the, uh, what he, he perceived as what is good for or what the villain wanted. Right. He was willing to uh, do whatever his son wanted. Well, the Odana, I mean, be, uh, what we say, Dhritarashtra, if he was actually intelligent, he could actually see it was for the benefit of everyone, including his sons, to go along with Krishna's advice. So he was blind in the wrong way. Not that his sons were right, they were completely wrong. But because of his attachment, he followed that and didn't want to, you know, go against them. He wanted, and of course, he also wanted them to rule the world too. So he was blind on so many, so many fronts. So how can we prevent ourselves to becoming ignorant in what to do for the benefit, the best interest of our children? is that we follow the, the proper guidance. And therefore, we understand there are certain principles. There's principles to follow that are for the welfare of the child, for the material benefit. And then there is also principles of our spiritual guidance. So we learn those principles and we apply them. That's all. Anything that's contrary to that, we try to avoid. Um, if the children want to do something wrong, it's not like that we accept that and because they are children and we, it's not love, it's called misplaced sentiment. Prabhupada talks about a story about how misplaced sentiment causes harm to all. He talks about two stories, two different stories. Both of them actually happened when he was growing up in India. And one of the stories was there was one young boy. He, uh, he was three years old. And he came down with, um, what is that disease? Uh, 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 he came down with a pretty difficult disease. 
And one of the things you have to do when you have this disease is you have to fast. So the boy's only three years old and he's being, he's not given food by his mother because his mother's been told by the doctor he has to fast. And so now she has to go out and she tells her daughter, who is about 11 years old, you watch your younger brother and don't give him anything to eat, even if he cries. It's not good for him. He can, it'll, it'll harm him even more. So the mother leaves. Uh, and then as soon as he leaves, the little boy says, oh, he calls his sister, can you make me paratas? Make me paratas. Make me paratas. So the, the daughter she somehow or other, I don't know what, what the mindset is, but she either forgot or didn't care to listen to her mother's instructions, and she cooked something for her, her little brother and gave it to him to eat. When the mother came back and found out about what happened, she got so angry at the girl and started chastising her where the girl was starting to cry, thinking, you know, he was hungry and I just wanted to feed him. Why am I getting chastised? So finally, of course, the boy didn't die. Uh, but what happened was the girl couldn't understand what, what she did wrong. But the parents understood, the mother understood clearly. So that was misplaced sentiment that sometimes you have to correct your child punish your child in some cases, restrict them for something, or give them advice that they don't want to hear. <laughs> and that may be necessary for their own good. The sentiment is, is that we allow them to do whatever they want to do in the name of what well, is family affection. And so part of the principle of loving care is correction and guidance. <laughs> In fact, it's a big principle. So once we understand that principle, then we're very uh, concerned that we give the right care and guidance to the children as they grow up, especially between the ages of six years old and age of 15. It says for the first five years, the child should be, parents should be very lenient to the child and not so much chastising them. When they become six and to 15, that is the formative years where they pick up all their, what we say, uh, values and habits in life. That time, strictness is meant to be given in, in, as a regular thing. Parents should be very strict in those and then when they reach 15 years of age, generally, you become friends with them. No longer in the mood of a parent, but in the mood of a friend. So if you have children who are 15 and older, then you have to advise them as a friend. And make them feel that you're actually, you know, giving them what they actually need in a friendly way. But before then, it's in a very strong parental way. So there's ways, according to Chanaka Pandit, according to the, the values and psychophysical nature of children and as they grow up on how to guide children in such a way as that they actually live a life uh, free from what we say the sufferings in this world. And that is we give them nice food, education, medical care, affection, guidance, spend time with them, and but most of all important, we guide them towards the spiritual practices also. So if you do all of the positive, generally when anything negative comes up, it's easy to deal with. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Was that helpful? Okay, thank you. Haribo Vivek. Haribo Vivek. Uh, I have a basic question in my mind. Why more Bhagavan favored Duryodhana? 
<laughs> that question comes up a few times, many times. Well, uh, Doyodana had taken martial instructions uh, from uh, Balaram. So Balaram was his teacher. He taught Doyodana how to fight. Doyodana came to him to learn club fighting, and Balaram taught him that. So Doyodana was actually his student. So there is an etiquette that one never abandons one's disciple, student, children under any condition. <laughs> so therefore, when the fight between Doyodana and Bhima was there at the end, and of course, um, uh, Balaram came, and uh, what he did was he tried to make peace between two of these fighters. He said, actually, he said, Bhima, you are more powerful, and Duryodhana, you are more of a skilled fighter. So this fight will go on and on and on, and no one will win. So both of them looked at Balaram like, why are you bothering us? And Balaram could understand they weren't interested in any good instructions, and he left the whole situation and didn't return for many, many years after that. But what happened was that Krishna understood that Balar that Diodana could not be defeated uh, by Bhima, so he taught Bhima, and then he actually took, gave him a trick and told him to cheat. And that's a whole story how... Doyodana was killed by Bhima because uh, uh, Bhima broke Kshatriya rules in order to uh, and defeat him. He says you never hit uh, the uh, opponent below the belt and he hit him in his, in his thigh area and broke his thigh. When he broke his thigh, and then he was no longer able to fight. <laughs> And then, when he was actually in that position, he asked Krishna, why did you do that? And Krishna said, well, you know, uh, he was saying, you cheated. You know Kshatriya rules. It's not." A... Krishna said, yeah, you also disrobed, the, you also were a party to disrobing Draupadi in the assembly, embarrassing a chaste woman, chaste woman. So you also broke the rules. <laughs> So therefore, yeah, so the reason why Balaram was because that was his, that was his uh, student. He had taught him how to fight. So Balaram, when he saw the situation, he just left. Mm-hmm. Hare Krishna. Uh, I wish you had her on the phone with me. She'd like to ask you a question. Of course. <laughs> you know, oh, uh, Hare Krishna, Maharaj, my name is Hare Krishna, my name is Hare Krishna. This is really about the uh, uh, Barbara. This is something I just wanted to ask you. Uh, a devotee friend of mine put up a big banner of Hare Krishna. Uh, yeah, they're seeing the Hare Krishna banner in the window, and it, and uh, yeah, that's Krishna's way of, of planting seeds. Yeah. Yeah, if it's a very attractive banner, the holy name even makes it more attractive. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Thank you for being with us. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there any more questions? She's wondering whether our our ability to select accept guidance and advice. Oh, well, we we become selective in what guidance and advice we take. Not selective, but more reflective. Well, when you get guidance and advice, you think about how to execute it. And that's reflecting on what it means and how to carry it out. If you have, if it's clear, then go ahead and do it. If it's not clear, then get get more advice coming from the person that you received the advice from. Everything should be clear. There's no doubts. Krishna says, for one who has doubts, this process is very difficult to execute. Everything should be clear. And everything can be made clear when we ask questions. Therefore, a whole big part of our tradition is to hear and then ask questions based on what we hear in order to clarify the points and at the same time see how it applies to us in our day-to-day -day life in Krishna consciousness. Yeah, we have to be reflective, but clear. Should be no doubts. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. There's another question from, let's say, iPhone. I don't know the name. It says, Hare Krishna Maharaj, I accept my humble obeisances. Why you wish to? Is still involved in the gambling when Dropley tried to stop him doing gambling. And he can also, he is also conscious of Duryodhana's evils. Hmm. Is it his own fault or is it totally by Krishna's encouragement? Yudhishthira is just a puppet to fulfill Krishna's will? Um, well, you can use that principle for everything. Ultimately, Krishna's will plays itself out in different ways. But in this case, it's because, you know, he had that tendency to gamble. Not only a tendency, he was he was he had a, a strong liking for gambling. That was his one of his weaknesses. That was his weaknesses. Although he was a great personality and had a great character, he still enjoyed gambling. And then that's where Duryodhan took the advantage and got Shikundi. Uh, I think it was yeah, Shikundi. I think it was not Shikundi, but uh, Shikuni. Shikuni. Shikuni to have a pair of loaded dice, and those dice were loaded. And Shikuni used them against Yudhisthira to defeat Yudhisthira and then take everything from the Pandavas. Uh, a Kshatriya will not turn down a challenge. So that's the thing. He was challenged and therefore he accepted the challenge. Prabhupada said in one of his lectures that if a Kshatriya, if someone comes to a Kshatriya and says, I want to fight with you, then he will agree to do that. That's a real Kshatriya. Kshatriya will not turn down a challenge. But, you know, how many Kshatriyas do we have today? Not many. 
Most of people who like to fight are sudras, not kshatriyas. <laughs> So yeah, that was his weakness. He couldn't turn down that challenge. But he was cheated by Sukuni. Anything else? Mm -hmm. We have something from the local devotees here. Can I take that one? Okay, I'll repeat the question. Um, from what I see, it can possibly be connected to the topics you spoke about, but it's not explicit, explicitly about Mahabharata. It's, uh, it goes like this. If someone is so much attached to their sense of false ego that it brings them to a very severe mental condition, is there a way to help such a person by prayer or otherwise? If someone has such a false ego that they're killing themselves with their own false ego, what do we do to help them? Well, you have to see the situation and see what... And try different things to help them. Uh, we all have false egos. Depends on to what degree that false ego is there. False ego simply means I am this body and I am the enjoyer. That's the essence of the false ego. I am the controller, I am the enjoyer. And so if we can teach people that actually there is another controller who is controlling everyone, Ishwara Parma Krishna. That ultimately, if we take shelter of that controller, then he controls us in the best possible way for our benefit. When we try to control, we never know what's going to happen. We should pray that if we we're in a position to do control on behalf of Krishna, we pray for, for the mercy of the great souls so we can execute that devotional service in such a way that it becomes pleasing to everyone. So we're given position of controllers too, but on, a, on, a small, on this level, in order to organize things and to uh, make things happen. But on behalf of our spiritual master, on behalf of of Krishna. Well, one who tries to control simply for their own sense gratification will always be miserable. How to wake them up? Well, try different things. <laughs> Speak to him, tell, teach him how to chant, <laughs> give him some books on on the false ego and how it works. <laughs> if you want to help someone and you're sincerely trying your best, pray to Krishna and see how he can inspire you to help others. But if you realize you can't help someone or that person doesn't want any help, then just pray for them. Yes. So this is from Devarshi Narada Prabhu. If the Tarashtra had this problem of weakness of the heart, he, he was not responding well to all this good advice which he was being given by many people, including Krishna. Now the question is, did he have a choice because this battle had to be, uh, this battle was prearranged in order to reduce the burden of the world. And this is one of the reasons why Krishna appeared, heeding the prayer of Mother Bhumi. So it seems that he could not have 
listen to the advice because then this Krishna's mission would not be carried out. So my question is, did he have a choice or was he in some way conditioned to take this choice to neglect the advice? I mean, if you want to deal with things on that level, then everything is Krishna's arrangement. And then what do you do? We have to act on our level, and we have to follow religious principles like that. Uh, so if Krishna wanted to reduce the burden of the earth, he could have did it in many ways. In fact, Krishna himself made an effort to stop the war by coming to Duryodhana and offering, you know, just asking him for the Pandavas to be able to rule five villages. So Krishna tried to, we see this battle of Kurukshetra was the last, you know, the last result of all kinds of other attempts to avert war like that. It doesn't, I mean, Krishna could have reduced the population of the world in other ways. He didn't have to do it that way. So you might say, but you can never understand was he influenced by Krishna to act in that way. I would say that was pure mental speculation. We have to take the facts as they're given and not always use the higher principle to solve all of our situations. Just like this coronavirus, we can use the higher principle here but then we have, how do we deal with it on this level? <laughs> we have to function on this level. We know behind the scenes, ultimately, the Supreme Lord is carrying out everything. But to understand how he does things and why he does what he does and when he does and who he uses is not, we're not able to just to speculate and say this is the way, is this, can we say this is the actual truth? Ultimately, you know, just like ultimately everything is spiritual. Nothing is matter. But uh, everything is Krishna, ultimately. But can we worship everything as Krishna? That would be called pantheism. That's not, that's not bhakti. So ultimately, you have to deal with things on the level that you are functioning on according to the, the guidance of spiritual master and Krishna himself. To, to say that that was the reason why he didn't listen is completely against the, what, is, what is being said in the Shastras because the Shastras are condemning Vidarastra in so many ways. I mean, for not following the advice of Vidura, not following the advice of Parasaram, not following the advice of Krishna. And they're teaching us a lesson that, you know, this, this family attachment goes so deep that one cannot hear what is actually one's best in, for one's best interest. So we, can, we have to accept it on that level whether the higher principle was working or not, we don't really know. It's working in one sense, but Krishna may have, Krishna can do what he wants to do in many different ways. When we cooperate with his plans, it works accordingly. When we don't cooperate with his plans, he has another plan for getting what he wants to have done. He requires our cooperation to carry out his plans. But when we don't cooperate, he just uses another way to, to fulfill his plans. Ultimately, his plan will, will manifest. So I think we have to deal with it on the level that we are seeing it instead, instead of using just the, the principle that it's Krishna's will. It's Krishna's will. Krishna has two things. He has his permissive will, and he has what he wants to happen. He allows things to happen, 
and he perm and he wants things to happen. Certain things he allows, certain things he wants. So we have to be able to see, you know, that even things that do happen, he's allowing to happen. And it's not that he wants them to happen. He's just allowing it because that's how material energy is working. Mm -hmm. Because he puts material energy in a, working in a certain way, he allows that material energy to work according to how he's put it in practice. But he can step in and change that, but generally he doesn't. Only in certain cases, when it needs to be, then he actually changes how the laws of material energy work. Mm -hmm. So for us, you know, just like it says, everyone is a devotee. It's true. Every living entity is a devotee. But can you deal with everybody on that level? No. You have to deal with them on the level that they're acting on. <laughs> so we have to deal, we have to understand the situation with Dhritarashtra, according to how the Acharyas are telling, giving us, that he was spiritually blind, materially blind. Okay. Can I sing the Shringa Day prayers? Yeah, for the um, Mahesh Puri, just to pray for him one of the yams. That's okay. Uh, I could do that, but I'm sitting here in uh, Zagreb Temple, and the Pujari is offering Arti right now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so if I sing the Shringa Day prayers while the Pujari is offering the Charmer a fan, <laughs> but the Pujari is signaling to me, he says it's okay if I do it. So, all right, I'll do it. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, is there a response to it or do I sing it straight through? Okay, um, I'll just, I'll sing, uh, well, well, I'll do it here with the devotees and we'll just respond with the devotees here. Namaste Hinata Sring Ha Hi Ha Ha Namaste Hinata Sring Ha Hi Ha 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 Palada Lada Dai Hine Hiranya Kashi Purvaksha Srila Tankana Kalahi He tonish him ha pad tonishing ho hoin. I had toy a toy a mita tonishing ha. By here, the sim hard ho hoin. And a sing a hum a dim shot and hum up a day. And have a car to come up, but hey, and a come a good thing. Hum, Dali Tali, and your cassie poor town who bring home. 
Thank you, Mahaprabhu Prabhu. Look forward to Hare Krishna. See you all tomorrow. Thank you, my obeisance is Hare Krishna. Happy, happy drama. Hare Krishna. <laughs>